welcome to the first episode of Rocket Talks. Uh, I am your host, Rocket Guy. Um, so yeah, for the first episode, we will be covering liquid bipropellant rocket engine power cycle. So what does that even mean? What is a liquid bipropellant rocket engine power cycle? That seems very that sounds very complicated, um, but it's really just a way that you can actually categorize your rocket engines, right? So, um, so pretty much the first thing first, what is a power cycle. A power cycle basically revolves around how power is derived to feed the propellants through the turbo pumps and into the combustion chamber. Um, it's just like I said, a, an easy way or at least one of the ways that you can categorize all of the different types of rocket engines, right? Every single rocket engine is unique in some way or another. However, each one usually follows one of these five or six different kind of categories that we'll be covering today. Um, so the main thing that you need to know uh, starting off about these power cycles is that you have two different types of systems. You have an open cycle system, and this refers to basically any system that does not have all of the propellant and its byproducts go through the engine. Um, this usually refers to a, a gas generator cycle, and gas generator cycles um, can be found on the Merlin 1D, both the vacuum um, variant and the core stage variant. Um, it's probably the most common type of rocket engine out there. Um, it was also used on the F1 engine and the J2 engine, which were both used on the Saturn, the Saturn V. Um, so now that you have the open cycle system, you also have the closed cycle system. Um, and so a closed cycle system, is, as, as I'm sure you can guess, is just basically a system where all of the propellant um, goes through the engine and nozzle. And none of it is actually wasted by either throwing it overboard or, or you know, attaining losses due to a secondary flow. Um, so basically all of your propellants are used to spin the turbines and then all of your propellants are going through the combustion chamber um, and out the nozzle. So that's that's what a closed system is. Uh, the expander cycle is most commonly known for, uh, uh, you know, being used for the RL-10 on, on the Centaur upper stage, right? The Centaur, um, which is used on um, the Atlas V vehicles, right? It uses an expander cycle. So we'll go here in a minute and kind of walk you through everything. So what goes on with an expander cycle and how is it different with with a gas generator or a or a uh, stage combustion engine? A stage combustion engine. Well, you'll notice here there's no gas generator and there's no preburner. So, there's no gas generator and there's no preburner. But how does it get how does it spin the turbine? How does it spin the turbo pumps? Um, it actually uses it, this the one of the drawbacks and one of the main things to know about this expander cycle is it can really only be used with uh, low boiling point uh, rocket engines or low boiling point fuel and oxidizer rocket engines right so this is best used for methylox engines hydrolox engines um, liquid uh, propane or natural gas engines can also be used for this um, but basically you need a cryogenic uh, rocket fuel or oxidizer because that's what you actually use to heat up just by the natural regener regenerative cooling of the rocket engine nozzle that, gen that then gets heated up, expands out to hot gas now, and then that's what you dump into your turbine to spin your turbine, and then that all gets put into your combustion chamber, right? So I'll walk you through this a little bit more slowly, right? Here's your turbo pump. This is your fuel. This is your oxidizer. Your fuel begins to be pumped down into your regeneratively cooled rocket engine, right? It gets superheated, right? Because now, uh, once your rocket engine actually turns on, right, it's, it's now getting heated. It's now getting uh, really hot really fast. Um, so by the time it gets out to the other side of your regenerative cooling jacket, it's now gaseous form. Um, so basically, that's what you use. It's now superheated gas is expanding. Um, throughout your entire rocket engine design cycle, and that's what actually gets pumped into your turbine that now spins your turbo pumps, and then all that gets dumped into your combustion chamber. Um, this is a really, really nice and simple design, right? Because your oxidizer just goes straight into your combustion um, your combustion chamber, and there's no moving parts, or there's no like pre-burner or, or gas generator that has to be used to actually spin your turbine, right? So pretty simple. You just got to heat up your fluid, make sure it expands, and then you use that fluid to spin your turbine, and there you go. You have full function over your rocket engine and your turbo pumps and everything. So it's actually really, really simple, really cool design, but its drawback is it can only be used for uh, cryogenic fuels, mainly. You know, fuels that actually have a really low boiling point. So if we go ahead and spin this up, like I said, it's a very simple design. As soon as you get pressure in, into your rocket engine, you now have your turbine spinning and your turbo pump spinning 
So there you go. Your your engine's happy. You're going to space, right? So it's one system, right? Your engine starts to spin up. Your turbine starts to spin. Your turbo pump starts to spin, and you have rocket engine happiness. Um, <clears throat> now, you might be asking yourself, well, how does it actually get started if it requires regenerative cooling to heat up the fluid to spin your turbine? That's one of the drawbacks with a system like this, right? Because this system actually relies on a very, very hot rocket engine nozzle to expand your, your cryogenic fuel to actually spin your turbine and to, you know, to actually expand it into hot gas to spin your turbine. That is, in fact, one of the drawbacks of this system as well. Um, so it's a very, very nice, simple system, but it also has its drawbacks, and it's hard to um, to get it started. You actually have to usually have like a heat exchanger. Um, you know, it's really dependent on its the system's stored heat capacity. You actually usually have to use like a like I said a heat exchanger to actually begin the process to actually have everything start to um, to go, um, and then and then once it's actually up to operating temperatures, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. Um, now with something like this, since it is in fact a closed cycle, you get very high performance. Um, and since it also uses cryogenic fuels, inherently cryogenic fuels are, you know, um, more you know more efficient than something that is like RP1, right? Non-cryogenic fuels tend to have uh, less energy, less efficiency than cryogenic fuels. Um, so this is a very very you know stable, simple, um, high efficiency sort of cycle. Um, so what are some of the d other disadvantages it comes with is that this is very limited in terms of operating pressure. This is usually meant for small to medium engines, um, mainly upper stage engines. I think that's all it's been used for today is RL10. Um, so it's a very, very good efficient engine cycle, but you're, you're limited to your operating pressure, right? Because your, your operating pressure is directly proportional to how much fuel you can actually get heated up inside the nozzle to actually spin your turbine. So the larger your nozzle goes, um, you only you can only heat up your gas so much before it, it's just it, you're not getting any more energy output from it. So you're kind of limited on how big you can go with your rocket engine nozzle and therefore your operating pressure. Um, so anyway, so that is an expander cycle. Um, like I said, uh, expander cycles can be really good in terms of throttle ability. Um, it can also be really, really good for me small to medium um, pressure class missions, right? So something like the RL-10, I believe, only has somewhere on the order of like 150 kilonewtons, like 110 kilonewtons, something like that. So it's not a very large rocket engine, but um, it's very, very efficient, right? Because it also uses uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So even though it's not high thrust, it's very efficient and very, very reliable because you have no moving parts in terms of a pre burner or gas generator. You have not, you're not taking anything away from your propellant or your chemical uh, potential energy on trying to move uh, your turbine separately. You're using all of your propellant to be, you know, exhausted out of your rocket engine nozzle to help get you to space. Uh, so something like this is really, really cool. Something worth noting, though, is that you have an expander cycle and then you also have what's known as a dual expander cycle. Um, so what is a dual expander cycle? Well, going back to our full flow stage combustion cycle where you had two pre-burners operating two separate turbines to operate your individual turbo pumps, a dual expander cycle has that same exact uh, principle. You have uh, two turbines to spin your individual turbo pumps. Um, so the operation is still the exact same. You can either use your fuel, your oxidizer, or both. Um, if you really wanted to, to wrap it, you know, to regeneratively cool your rocket engine nozzle to have your fuel and oxidizer expand, which then runs the individual turbines. Um, but that's all. That's pretty much all uh, a dual expander cycle is. Is that instead of just having one turbo, uh, one two turbo pumps run off of one turbine, you know, you now have two turbines to actually operate your individual turbo pumps. Um, so that's what a turbo uh, dual expander cycle is. To my knowledge, there has never been a dual expander. Um, cycle ever flown. I believe some are being looked at to being made, but I don't believe anything has flown yet.